I'm going to be introducing Greg Horn. Give me a wave, Greg. You're on. Greg will make his way to the front. Thank you. Um, Greg is from the Skeena Watershed Conservation Coalition. Greg's going to speak. He's awesome. I haven't met him yet, but I bet he's awesome. He's going to speak at this rally. Give it up for Greg! Let's make some noise for all these land defenders standing out here so proud, standing in front of everybody, telling you what is difficult for them on their territories and feeling their support around them. Thank you to the organizers and to the people of this land who acknowledged and welcomed the rest of us here. Um, I've had the honor for the past few years of living up on Gitsan territory and working with the chiefs of the House of Lukajewicz of the Gitsan Nation, who you heard from Richard Wright uh, just a few moments ago. Um, I won't talk long, but I work for an organization that's been working in the north trying to raise awareness and understanding around the LNG onslaught that our province is currently under. And this is a different beast than fighting the Enbridge pipeline. This is a different beast because it's way bigger. There are 20 pipelines now proposed for BC to carry frack gas. If only two or three pipelines went ahead, we would have to double the amount of fracking taking place in Treaty 8 territory in the northeast of this province. Think what would happen if 10 of these pipelines went ahead. But the craziest thing of all is that it's likely that zero or one or two pipelines would ever go ahead because the economics of LNG in the past four years have fallen apart. Which means that Christy Clark and all the other politicians that are in this shiny building promoting LNG have fallen on their face. And they will not stand up and admit that their LNG dream is in fact an LNG nightmare because, for one reason, they made an election promise four years ago that they would deliver LNG. At that time, in Asia, LNG was five times the price that it is in North America. That's the only reason they want to sell gas to China, Japan, and Korea. Because they could make a buck that they couldn't make by selling it to Alberta to get Alberta off of coal power. So they tell us this lie that they want to sell it to China to get them off of coal power. It's a lie. They want to make profit. Space. Sorry, space. I'm popping out there. I'm sorry. Right now, LNG is worth no more in Asia than it is here. There's not one of these projects that is economically feasible to build right now. All of the proponents are backpedaling. They're saying, ah, I don't know if we want to actually build these things. We can't make money. And yet, they're hosting an LNG conference to which the tickets are $1,800 to even go to that conference. How much money is being spent of taxpayer dollars and money that could be going to First Nations for other things that are needed in promoting a dream that will likely never happen? The two projects that they are banking on to go ahead are, the from, are in the territories of the people you've heard from tonight. The one is in Squamish area. It's called Wood Fiber LNG. It's a smaller project than some of the other projects. As you heard, it received consent from the elected band council today. They want that one to go, to, head, to go ahead. And the only other one, the only other company that's still willing to talk about building LNG in this province is Patronus. You've heard tonight from Joey and Christine from Lax Calams and Richard from Maddie Lee. These people are standing on the front lines to defend our province and our country and their territories against a company that two weeks ago was revealed through a leaked safety audit that they've been operating offshore oil rigs in the Indian Ocean and around the world that were in such terrible states of disrepair. They had not had routine safety checks done that were scheduled every six months. They've been overdue by 20 years. 
And there were oil rigs that the auditors said were at risk of causing human death imminently. This is the same company that a month ago it was revealed that the president of the company, who is also the prime minister of Malaysia, had suddenly uh, mysteriously found $700 million in his personal bank account that he couldn't account for. His own cabinet ministers called him out, as did the Attorney General of Malaysia. And when they did, he fired them. There's $11 billion in debt that they have not explained where it came from. This company is corrupt. It has one of the worst international safety records. In Borneo, they've been building LNG projects where they don't even tell the indigenous people where the pipelines will go until they are bulldozing their villages. This pipeline in Borneo exploded last year because they built it on unstable ground. The pipeline that they want to build to Flora Bank, Flora Bank itself, the most essential fish habitat in northwestern BC, the second biggest salmon run in Canada, is on unstable ground. This is a company on record of not being able to do things safely anywhere. What do we think they're going to do to the second biggest salmon run in this country? This is why it's so important to stand behind the members of Lax Kalams, Simagat Yahan on Lakula, and the members of Mari Lee, the members of the House of Lukachiewicz who are standing strong on their territory. They're fighting the Patronus project against a company who recklessly wants to build amidst crappy LNG prop, uh, prices in the world, probably because they have totally other motivations. Uh, that we don't even know about because they're so corrupt and connected to so many things in the world. Um, so that's just a bit of the grand scheme of LNG in this province right now. It doesn't make sense economically. The projects that are still on slate to go ahead are in the worst spots that could possibly happen. I haven't mentioned the safety issues. Wood fiber LNG would have to send tankers right by West Vancouver and Bowen Island within the blast zone of an LNG tanker that, if it was punctured in any means, would send a cloud of LNG vapor over the water and into communities within a 3.5 kilometer radius that, if ignited, would be a fireball of proportions that no one has ever seen. Canada has no shipping regulations about LNG. None. They don't exist. In the States, they don't let LNG tankers go that close to cities. We have no regulations. They're not talking about this in their shiny building. Um, that's all I want to say. So thanks for letting me speak to the organizers and to everybody that's come out here. Um, I know that the message is getting in there in some ways. I've heard bits of that. They're shaking in their boots. They know that LNG is a big lie. I love this sign right here. It's a bunch of hot air. It's a bunch of gas. You need to talk to people about this LNG propaganda that we're still being fed four years later and tell them that it's crap. Question the hundred million dollars, that hundred billion dollars Christy Clark talks about, the hundred thousand jobs, the newfound relationship with First Nations. Ask her where that is. Right now, there are three blockades against LNG led by First Nations. There are multiple court cases. Today, Luke Kachiewicz announced a court case against the pipeline that would supply the Patronus LNG project. <laughs> Through First Nations court cases and First Nations stopping these projects on the ground, these things will never happen. And it's with support from people all through this province for things other than the big shiny ones like Enbridge to get your heads wrapped around and the other people that aren't here most importantly their heads wrapped around what LNG actually is it's through this movement that will actually stop this thing um, I want to put a, a shout out at the end to uh, a charity that's been helping uh, Maddie Lee raise funds to cover their court costs uh, that's Raven Trust Maddie Lee is currently still raising funds to cover the costs of uh, fighting this pipeline in court. Um, you can come talk to me afterwards if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, and uh, 
I just want to say thanks again, and uh, let's uh, spend the night making a bunch of great noise. Um, Harold Lavender is our next speaker. Going to be calling him up from Rising Tide and Alliance Against Displacement. Harold. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out to you the fact is uh, these governments, uh, the liberals and these corporations, which would uh, destroy the earth, which would disrespect indigenous rights and the right and the need for consent of indigenous people to build pipelines on their land and would poison the earth. They, they're, they're also governments of social injustice. And so it's no accident, in fact, that the BC government, which you, you know is spending millions to promote LN, LNG and giving away the store to induce the companies to still invest us in a sinking ship, uh, they, they haven't raised welfare rates in eight years is a tremendous housing crisis which has hardested in indigenous and low-income people and there's a desperate need for social housing and people need to not be displaced uh, in, 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 in communities where, where the environment is destroyed or, or their lands are taken away and also in the cities and so that, there's a crisis here too for indigenous people in terms of being able to live good lives and these issues are all linked so I want you to link this struggle like to save the earth and so everyone can live in dignity and with justice. Woo! I want everybody, you're gonna leave me, you're gonna join me in a chant. Christy Clark was in here today. I want everybody to join me and say, you fracked up, you fracked up. You fracked up! 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 Yeah! was mentioned by a few speakers earlier and I want to reiterate the message as well. Whether it's the Una Stoughton camp or the, or the Maddie Lee camp or the many others that are happening across indigenous country. We are seeing indigenous people moving from rhetoric of saying the land is ours, the land is ours to actually enforcing it. Same thing happening on Lilu Island as well. I wanted to acknowledge them. Give it up. See, I have this belief about being sovereign. I don't use the word sovereignty too often, but I have this belief about it. See, I had a very wise granny. My granny, she, her father was a hereditary title holder among the Nungis people, the Kwakwakiwak. Kwa it's part of where I come from as well. And my granny had this teaching, and she shared it with her kids and her grandkids and her great-grandkids. And she said, nobility, don't go around telling other people they're noble. Real nobility, don't go around telling other people they're noble. She said, if you are from nobility, people will know. She said, look at the queen. The queen doesn't go around telling people she's the queen. Everybody knows she's the queen. And I feel the same way about sovereignty. You go around telling people you're sovereign. It's not the same thing if you're actually enforcing it on the ground. People will know you're sovereign because you can enforce it. I challenge everybody, I challenge you to think about this, this land. See, I don't call it stolen land anymore. Yeah, thank you. Woo! This land we're on, any land you travel across this country or the countries that you visit, whether it's in treaty territory or non-treaty territory, I want you to think about this. Is the land stolen? Is it? I was challenged on this. 
but a very smart young man, indigenous man. And he asked, is the land really stolen? Or are our people just not enforcing our jurisdiction? It's very different. Stolen, it is stolen land, is a passive response. It is accepting something and being a victim to that crime. The reality is our indigenous nations are starting to realize there's a difference between self-determination and acting it and living it and upholding that responsibility. And many of these First Nations communities and indigenous communities and the clans from them understand this and are doing it. That includes Lilu Island, that includes uh, Maddie Lee, and that includes the Unistoten as well as many others. So let's show our utmost respect for these indigenous people, indigenous communities, indigenous nations, and the hereditary families that are upholding law on their land that has never been surrendered for 10,000 years. Give it up. Oh, <laughs> sweet.